Patrick, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mustafa. How are you today? Thank you for uh, joining us. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Most welcome. I've been looking forward to this. I've been absolutely looking forward to it since we had our first conversation and you told me that you're tackling this problem that we're about to talk about, which I resonated with. I remembered back when I finished my university and yeah, I know how everyone who finishes their education goes through the exact same process. So, Patrick, you're an academic. You're the co-founder and CEO of uh, Inferential Futures. I'll give you some time. Tell us, tell, tell, tell our listeners, what is Inferential Futures? Okay, so Inferential Futures is about empowering young people to understand what they want to do with their lives in terms of their career, uh, how they want to create meaning in their lives through their career, and to offer them the opportunity to understand what it is that they can devote their lives to, how uh, to give them a chance to explore lots and lots of opportunities that are out there, things that they don't know about. There's lots of things that they don't know that they don't know about. And there's lots of things that lie in the future that kind of no one knows about with the change in the nature of work, the, uh, uh, the, the, the way in which artificial intelligence is going to change the nature of employment. So it's a big landscape. And what it's about is operate, uh, giving them a way of understanding kind of what might lie ahead of them and what direction they might take. Okay. What brought this about? So I want to talk about what brought this about because if, 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 I'm, a, if I'm a graduate, let's just say I've, I'm about to finish my university, for example, my uh, my younger brother, he's just f finished his master's. He's had his uh, presentation interview today. He doesn't have a clue what's next. He's got a master's in physics, and he, all he thought about was the next step for me has to be a PhD in physics. Because of COVID, there's a lot less funding. He's realized he's not going to get funding for a PhD. So him and millions other others like him are in the same boat. What? What made you guys come about? What was it that you thought, okay, this is the problem. There isn't really a solution. I want to okay. help. Yeah, absolutely. So as an academic for many years, I saw exactly this kind of problem. Uh, and I've had so many conversations with young people that, that revolve exactly around this. Um, Ed, my co-founder in the US, and I met quite accidentally online, and this is another kind of part of the whole story here, because so much of what happens in our lives is accidental. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so I know from talking to you, you know, there's some amazing coincidences. Me being part of Silicon Roundabout is accidental. Yeah. Us meeting is accidental. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Uh, so Ed and I crossed paths online. There was another project I was working on, and he stumbled across it. And as we talked over the following months, we found a joint kind of cause in the problems that young people face in determining what they want to do with their lives. Everybody can relate to this, whether it's through yourself, remembering the kind of problems that you had, or your family, or you've worked with people. And uh, so we looked around, and I know that uh, I knew that a lot of people are interested in this, but there's a great tendency to focus on this as something that young people need to address and they have to do it uh, as if it's kind of careers education is being done to them rather mm. than for them if you if you if you get if you get what i mean and i was really i've been really struck how so much of the careers advice the the, the whole kind of structure of that is that it's 
something that you've got to do. Now you've got to think about getting a job. And for anyone at university, I mean, we, we, we know we, in my academic career and since Ed and I have been working together and indeed before that, I've had loads of conversations with young people who say, you know, I get to the end of my second year at university and I'm thinking, OK, I've got one more year. And then what's going to happen there? Oh, God, I might have to go back and live with my parents or I'm going to have to find some way of early, right, better get a job. Um, and instead of focusing on what do I want to do with my life, at that point, that kind of existential crisis leads to this kind of short-term focus on better get a job and I suppose it would better be something that I'm interested in. Um, so It throws the, them off the wagon after that. Well, it, the thing is that the model that we've built up for young people deciding about careers is revolves very much around what we call critical incidents. So there are points in your education, and particularly focusing on university education, there are points when you think, yeah, okay, I better work out what I want to do with my life. And that could be, you know, the end of the, your second year and somebody's just said, maybe you could better get some work experience this summer. Um, can be all sorts of things. And the problem with this, through these critical incidents, is you realise that there are so many other distractions on young people at that point. Yeah, I've got to get a job. Yeah but I've yeah. got to pass my exams, I've got a dissertation to write, uh, I've got my part-time job to support myself during studies, and I know I've got to focus on you know, making sure I keep that. There's so many things in their lives. And, of course, in the last 12 months, COVID and all of that oh, kind of stuff has God. just been uh, added into the mix. So what we wanted to do was to put something literally into the hands of young people that would give them the tools that they need to start exploring what the world of work might look like for them and to give them information and structure and support that would guide them through that purpose and, if possible, cut through the critical incidents that are going on elsewhere in their lives. So bring them back to that whole point of focusing on uh, finding a career, finding some meaning in their lives. The fact that you guys came to exist as, as an organisation would you say it is an answer to a systematic problem we have with our current educational system that students are being are in there getting educated for the sake of education rather than to learn to enter the world of employment it's uh, there's an enormous tension in education and you can see that it is happening in universities at the moment uh, that there is traditionally a university academic many years ago would have said, well, employability is nothing to do with me. I'm a history professor. My job is to teach these young people history and, if possible, to turn them into historians or at least to be able to think like historians. historians. And, yeah, then they'll find a job because there's always jobs for graduates, as, as there were in the past. A disconnect, Connected, basically. Yeah, that's right. Now, one of the things that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is the whole system of metrics for universities has made the performance of graduates in the job market a crucial part 
of the way that universities are assessed. So one of the key metrics is what proportion of your graduates have got a job six months after the end of graduating, okay? Now that focuses the minds of those people in universities whose job it is to plan on how the university is going to continue to run as a business. Because if you don't meet those metrics, then that is going you're to have an performing. impact. Mm. Yeah, you're not performing. And whether it's uh, through government funding or whether it's through student or prospective students looking at your university and saying, why are only a third of your graduates employed six months after graduating or whatever it happens to be? You know, you won't be in business very long. So that's a very interesting, for, and look, I find that very interesting, especially, and I wanted to ask this now. So you are an academic, you are an entrepreneur. So what's your stance here? Because are the universities supposed to operate like a business or are they an academic institution for education? Huge, huge existential kind of problem for universities right now. But I, I think that I don't know that all of my academic colleagues would share this view necessarily, but there has to be a view that the universities operate as a part of society. And if we have a mass system of university education, as we have now in this country, nearly one in two young people going to university once they leave school, then it's incumbent upon universities to ensure that when those young people leave the institution that they at least find themselves equipped with skills that enable them to earn a living of some kind. So, I, I, you know, it's not like going back 40 or 50 years when maybe 5% of young people went, went to, to university. university. That was a completely different deal, right? Uh, but now we've got a mass system and therefore it's got to work in such a way that people coming out of universities find themselves employable. Employability is very, very important. It's otherwise, and especially now, that a More university education is so expensive. You know? A million years ago when I went to university, I actually got paid to go to university. <laughs> You know, but it's not like that now. No, now you have now you now you have to pay an arm and a leg to yeah, go to university right. and graduate that's from right. university. And it's it's a very um, it's a very subtle thing because of course it's a loan and it's going to be repaid absolutely uh, afterwards. Well, you're graduating but, with fifty, sixty thousand pounds yeah, worth of debt. That, I mean, that's right. That's right. But the kind of message, nevertheless, is go to university, it's got to be worthwhile, uh, you know, you, you will find it a valuable experience no matter what you do. Um, but if you find yourself graduating with £60,000 worth of debt and you're never going to pay it off, then... What was the point? What's the point? And that's a huge problem and the government is just realising that this is a huge problem because all of this debt is on the country's balance sheet uh, and they've got to do something about it. So the government have just about woken up to this over the last few years. So the pressure on the institutions to ensure that young people are employable is immense. But, and this is a, a, a very important but, that it's not just about finding a job and ensuring that you're employed six months out. And that's where Inferential Futures comes in. And that's, that's exactly our point, right? Yeah. That what we want to do is to put this into the hands of young people so that they can find out what they want to do, but then remain engaged so that they've got a means of exploring two years out of university, five years out of university. Well, what's my next move? I was going in that direction, but it suddenly seems that the landscape in that direction has changed a bit because something's happened in the economy, there's a new technology that has completely changed what that direction looks like. Think of it like going out for a walk at the weekend with a, uh, well, no, you can have an OS map in your hand on your phone, 
right? And you can decide, I want to go over in that direction. That hillside looks really interesting. But you start to get over there, you realize, oh, I've got to walk through a bog to get there. Right, okay, I need to make some kind of change. And, oh, now I'm here. It looks as though that over there is now a bit more interesting, so I'll think I'll head over there. Now, if you're just out for a walk, yeah, you can do that. But if you think about the same kind of metaphor about how you plan to live your life, then you want a bit of data that helps you to decide, well, if I'm going to change direction, what direction am I going to go in? And how does that direction look as though it's going to be when I, you know, when I get over there? What's it going to be like? Um, so, and, and of course, when you're, I think we would all relate to this, you know, when you're in your 20s, it seems as though you're going to live forever. You know, that you think, oh, there's plenty of time, it's okay, I can spend six months doing that. And to a large extent, yeah, in your 20s, you can. That's the time when That's you can right. really explore. But time ticks past increasingly quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah? As somebody who's actually in his early 30s, I can, I, yeah, it, 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 it still hits me till now how different it is now how I feel, how I look at time, how yeah. I perceive work, how I, how my future, I, you know, envision my future, how different it is to yeah. how I saw all of that ten years ago. Yeah. Now, so, the, the, the the kind of nice thing now is that life expectancies have increased so much that for someone like you, um, if you want to you can comfortably envision working a working life that extends another 40, 45 years. You know, that's, that, that's, that's no problem. Um, and you'd still have some time to enjoy the fruits of that. You know, time and after that. Yeah, after that, you know. Uh, so it's, it's kind of different to that extent. But the other thing is that the pace of change of work the nature of working organizations is, is changing very fast. And you really do need something that enables you to widen your horizons and become uh, a, well, there's a kind of academic term for this, which is about a data vigilant person, somebody who's always on the lookout for information about the next choice and the choice after that that they are, that they're going to make and there's no shortage of information out there as you as you well know so the other thing that is really important for us is to say how do we put a tool into the hands of young people that enables them to find the information they need and to be alerted to information that's coming up on the horizon and that may have a bearing on their working lives. So um, governments engage in this on a very big scale. They call it horizon scanning. Have you come across this? I term? actually haven't, no. Okay. Haven't. So governments do this horizon scanning constantly. You know, what's coming over the horizon in that direction towards us? How do we think that's going to have an impact on our country, our economy, you know, whatever it happens to be. And that's going to be an essential component of life for any young person that wants to be potentially in control of their destiny as far as it affects their, their education needs, their employment and so on. You said something and I, I, I found it to be very, very interesting. You said that they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So what you're saying is the organization, your startup, will help young adults know what they don't know that they don't know about. That's, that's the idea, yeah. So to give you a, an example, uh, let's, I mean, let's take an example of a typical young person that we would see ourselves wanting to help would be first generation university parents and family who 
obviously have not been to university themselves and as a family they don't necessarily have the social capital to enable that young person to understand what is out there in, in the world. So you might think, as that young person might think, you might want to go in that direction. But you might say to them, well, have you thought about this? Let me give you an example. You know, they happen to be somebody who's articulate, personable, uh, good at persuading other people. You might say, have you ever thought about going into the diplomatic service? I don't even know what a diplomat... What's a diplomat? What on earth do they do? They don't know what they, they don't, don't know. They don't know what they don't know. You know, they're kind of vaguely conscious that... that, that oh, maybe not. <laughs> there are, there are diplomats di out there, but... There are diplomats out there, yeah. but what do they do? And what kind of person do you need to be? Oh, you think you think I could be a diplomat, okay? So, I mean, that's just one example. And, of course, there are things out there that none of us know. There are jobs on the horizon in parts of the economy that don't even exist. So that horizon scanning... So it predicts how, basically... The f what the future could look like, yeah, what certain jobs could evolve. What, what certain jobs could could look like, what the sectors of the economy are that are growing. I mean, one, one of the things is when we first started out, we realized that from exploring what's out there, huge amount of data, more data than you can shake a stick at. And it's growing by, what is it, petabytes per hour or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all this stuff is out there. How do you track this stuff? Well, there's plenty of ways. I mean, you know, even as an individual, you can set up Google searches. There's all kinds of things that you can do to make sure you're alerted to stuff that's happening. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, I mean, for any of us who, uh, you know, who, who are interested in a particular topic, you've got Google pinging an email to you once a week or once a day or whatever it is saying, oh, there's this result, go and have a look at this. Absolutely. Uh, and these, um, these intelligent agents are out there. You can set them off. They go wandering around the web, go looking for data. And that's, that's the whole point of being able to, first of all, understand how to do that. Okay, I need to set that up. What do I need to do? Okay, so if you've got to do all that manually and work out exactly what you need, that's a bit of a tough call. True. But to have a tool in your hand that says, okay, this is what you might be interested in, and we'll come on to that in a minute about how, you, how do you work that out. But this is what you might be interested in. These are the skills you need to develop. These are the... Um, uh, the things that you need to know about. Okay, we'll ping you every time something like that comes up, that was something you need to read or a video that you need to watch. Go and do that and then factor that in to your planning for the next steps, wh wh whatever that happens to be. Let's jump on right into it then. How do you do that? Okay. What, what's what's so behind it? The... When we got into this, um, the first thing that we said is it's got to be mobile. Okay, it's got to be in the palm of your hand, because Generation Z, these are the guys that we're talking about. Okay, they're the ones graduating now. They're the ones graduating, and even the even even millennials. I mean, guys guys like you, right? You you probably go to your mobile for most of the information Absolutely, that you get. Absolutely, almost everything. Yeah, everything, it's there. So we need something that works in the palm of your hand. Uh, the other thing that we know about Gen Z particularly is it's got to be quick and snappy. They are very impatient if Absolutely. they have to wait <laughs> for five seconds for something to pop up on the screen. And it's got to be something, we said, that reduces the friction of engagement with the whole process of working out what you want to do with your life. Now, the current 
the, the, the way in which careers has been done really hasn't changed much over the last 30, 40 years. I don't, don't know about you, when you were at school, whether you did a careers questionnaire, it might even have been on paper. I don't know, but those... It was, I remember, filling that, I remember yeah. filling that out, but until today, I just, I never understood what he was trying to tell me. Yeah. You know, I, I, I felt it was more of a an exercise, do that exercise, but I never felt that the results actually gave me what I wanted in a yeah. way. And, but at the same time, I felt it was whoever gave it to me didn't necessarily go through it in the right way. Because later on, when I became a postgrad and I did some research, I realized actually the science behind it is concrete. Yep, for sure. But I didn't, it, it wasn't being implemented properly. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it's, for a long time, it's been something that schools have, have done because it had to be done. We've got to do some careers education with them. Yeah. So we'll give them a questionnaire. Uh, then, of course, those questionnaires are now available online, so that makes it a little bit kind of slicker, and the results get processed that bit quicker, so you come back to you and say, what about this, what about that? Um, but this is still quite a, a high input process, right? That you have got to engage in this exercise and you don't necessarily know what's going to come out at the other end. It might be that you don't get anything worthwhile out of it. So what we said is we want, we want to be able to do this in such a way that we can reduce the friction, we can make this whole process a lot easier. So as we looked at it, um, there, were, there was some scientific research that we drew on in order to understand the background to what we wanted to do. And the first thing to say that as far as careers are concerned, uh, there's a very, very well understood method of profiling people which uh, was uh, produced by a, an academic, um, well it would be going back kind of 30, 40 years now, uh, which produces a set of career interests called the Holland Codes. The Holland Codes, okay, yeah. The Holland Codes. And these career interests, it's a six, it has six dimensions, okay, which has the acronym RIASEC, R-I-A-S-E-C, okay. So R stands for realistic are you somebody who's interested in a career that is very, very based on very con concrete kinds of things? Engineers are realistic, for example. Engineering is a realistic career. Um, tangible, I can tangible, see. Tangible, yeah, that's, you can feel it. Whereas uh, you might say, well, at the other extreme, being a philosopher might be realistic in some ways, but it's, as far as these codes are concerned, that's, yeah. that's not Polar about realistic. Polar in a way. Yeah, okay, so realistic, that's that. Um, I uh, is investigative. investigative. Uh, so that's about research. Do you enjoy finding stuff out? Are you somebody who's always on the lookout for new information? Or are you somebody who would prefer a job where effectively someone's more or less telling you what to do you know, you're following a set of instructions okay um, the others are a bit 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 simpler uh, so a is artistic okay so creative basically. you're a creative person yeah s is social do you enjoy working with other people or would you rather be doing something as an individual e is entrepreneurial which you know we get and that doesn't necessarily mean by the way, that you'd want to start your own business. An entrepreneurial person in this setting is somebody who enjoys running a business. It might be manage, managing a footwear store or something like that. Yeah, so that's entrepreneurial. And C is conventional. So are you somebody who is looking for you know, a, a, a job that has 
you know, perhaps fixed hours and, you know, a kind of very traditional... Nine you know, to five. You would, you would kind of say, um, apologies to any accountants and lawyers <laughs> out there, but, you know, accountants, lawyers, yeah. you know, that, that kind of thing. They don't really fall under the nine to five, but, yeah, no, yeah, you get yeah, what I mean. Convert, absolutely, you know, of yeah. course. So Ryasek Rias, is a very powerful uh, method of working out what people's career interests are. And the research, you know, pretty clearly shows that people uh, who are in work that aligns with their their career interests, that they're, they're happier than people who find themselves in situations where there is some kind of misalignment. Okay, now there is there's, there's a tool for finding out what your hole and codes are. There's a tool for exploring that. Uh, but again, it involves answering a set of questions. Not extensive, but you have to answer some questions. You have to go through them. So we thought, well, okay, now is there a way of kind of making that more slick? So we thought, well, okay, career interests and personality. There must be some kinds of links there. So we started to explore the literature in that area, and sure enough, yeah, people have very much worked on that. And we uh, looked particularly at a personality profiling system called the Big Five, okay, the five-factor model. Uh, five-factor model uh, developed a little bit earlier than the, uh, the, 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 the Holland Codes is a model, there's five dimensions here, okay, with the acronym OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N. O is for openness how open you are to new experiences, adventurous, and so on. Uh, C is for conscientiousness. So are you the kind of person that, uh, I suppose you would say, is reliable, someone who's going to turn up for things, and, you know, uh, and, 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 and so on. E is extroversion. A is agreeableness. And N is neuroticism, which is a kind of loaded word in this context it means are you somebody uh, who responds in a very kind of emotional way to things so I don't know if you've got something that's happening at work that you rather than kind of necessarily think it through keep your call yeah that's yeah. right okay so ocean is uh, uh, the, the, the acronym for the Big Five. And we looked at the literature and we realized that there is a way of getting from the Big Five personality to career interests. It's not straightforward. Uh, we've developed our own algorithms for doing that, which have been validated by the research that we've looked at and we've been also employing that with some test users to see whether that you know does this look like you if you do this is does, it, does is this taking you to yeah yeah does this look like you does it produce a set of career interests that kind of oh yeah okay i recognize that but i might be a bit more that than this or whatever now the beauty of this is that we have a number of ways of getting a personality profile very quickly. The method that we've focused on at the moment is text-based because that produces a very reliable uh, personality profile. Um, and from about five or six hundred words of text, if you think of something like uh, university uh, personal statement or a piece of reflective writing that you've done as part of your university it, it won't work with a history essay because that's not about you right? Yeah. but it will work with a piece of personal writing we can take that we can run that through the system uh, we've got a number of different systems that we reach out to for getting that profile Part okay. of the algorithm that you have. That's yeah. That's not our algorithm. That's that's a third party. Okay. okay. So we use a number of different third party systems for doing that. That comes back to us. Our own algorithms produce career produce, interests. Okay. Okay. 
and then bang, we can use that. So to give you one example from you putting in your university personal statement, okay, you hit the submit button on that. Within five seconds, eight seconds at outside, we can come back. Obviously, it gives you your career interest profile. But then from that, we've got a set of potential careers that might interest you. For each of those careers, we've got videos. We've got um, a description of the skills and the kinds of qualities that are required to succeed in those. Uh, we can then drill down and using another external data set, we can show for particular careers in that area, what do the salaries look like projected over the next five years? What does the employment market look future like? Future prediction, future, basically. This is future prediction. And this is, this is all based on labor market data that's available out there that we pull into our system and use. And it will also show you, in, in, the same, in the same length of time, you've got a list of jobs that are open at the moment in each of those areas. So that's, that's all on the screen in front of you within a matter of seconds. That's incredible. But to get to that point, you said that you've used um, the Holland Code yeah. and the Big Five. Now, there's tons of research I mean these have been out there I mean the Holland score I think 58 1958 1959 something, something like that, like yeah, that. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. and so and, and, and it's been used ever since but there is criticism of that would say that actually is quite old and doesn't necessarily match the current working world working environment what would what would you say to that I'd say that old isn't necessarily bad. The fact that it's old and been validated a good deal is actually something that uh, makes it very worthwhile. But remember, I mean, we're a startup, right? This is a starting point. Um, and our systems at the moment only do what we tell them to so do. So they're learning. So, you so what we've, well, we're helping them to learn. Mm. Of course, the next step is to actually turn them into systems that learn themselves from uh, feedback that comes that comes from users but um, the, uh, the there's, there's all kinds of uh, interesting paradoxes here I mean I'll give you one which is not directly related to what you said but it's just popped into my mind and that is that one piece of research showed that conscientious people get offered fewer jobs than people who are not very conscientious. So that's interesting. You would think, right, employers would want conscientious people. That's why we're okay. yeah. Right. Well, this is a kind of, uh, a, a kind of aberration of the statistics because it turns out that what happens is the conscientious people have a different way of applying for jobs to people who are not con conscientious or rather a different way of accepting jobs, right? conscientious person is somebody who is much more likely to sort of chase down one job and wait till they hear and then rather accept than or scatter. rather yeah and and is certainly not somebody right who's going to accept five job offers if they're offered to them so uh, it's a very interesting kind of um, uh, thing that as you start to dig into this you can see all kinds of sort of uh, things that, that that pop up that aren't necessarily as you would think they are. So it's another example of you not knowing what you don't know. Correct, okay? absolutely. In this, in this. So, yeah, there's clearly the nature of work and the nature of society is changing very fast, and it's very likely that any system that you come up with now for predicting what people might be interested in is going to grow and evolve as as you develop it but that's part of the part of the beauty of having mathematical models behind this because the mathematical models can change and you can learn and develop from the user feedback that you so in other get. words what you're saying that this isn't going to be the full 
core of the system, rather it is a starting point. It starts there. It starts here, and we've got a roadmap for how we want to develop the intelligence that lies under this. Go back to the name of the business, Inferential Futures. We are drawing inferences from people's personalities and their education and all other kinds of personal characteristics that they've got and helping them to look into their future as it is as part of a bigger future. So what I'd like to ask then, what I'd like to ask, and, you know, because this sounds, look, it sounds fantastic. It sounds great. Uh, if, if I'm an undergrad, if I'm a grad, perfect, because I don't know where else I could go. Um, there aren't that many avenues. But how does the business model work? as a business, how would it work? How does it work? Okay. Generating revenue, etc. So in our view, the whole of the recruitment and HR infrastructure is, is, is pretty broken really and ripe for some kind of disruption. Um, Welcome, this is what we do at Silicon Roundabout. We keep talking about that, the hiring is yeah, broken. It is. It's very difficult, it's very difficult. and. I think the think think of a really kind of an unusual example because I think this is actually quite a good uh, metaphor for, uh, for, for for thinking about the thing as a whole. Um, what is the most difficult kind of professional path to pursue? I would argue that becoming an actor is probably pretty much the most, di uh, making a living from Other being actor. an actor must be, must be one of the most difficult things to until do. Until you make it, basically. Until, until you, make you become it. a superstar That's or a Hollywood right. star. But, you know, I mean, we, we all know that there are thousands of actors out there. I mean, you, if not tens or hundreds uh, of thousands. Uh, exactly. You know, we've all been served in restaurants or bars. By, yes, absolutely. Them, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm an actor. I'm just waiting for the next job to come along, you know. Um, now, what do you need to succeed as an actor? You need an agent. You need somebody who's out there looking for you, looking for parts and gets in hold of the director and says, I've got the perfect person for this part. I know exactly who you need. Okay? That's the job of inferential futures, right? With a platform of talent, millions of young people using it, you've got a deep insight into all of those young people. You are the talent agent for those people who is able to say to an employer, got exactly the person that you need. I've got five people that look as though the people So if need. I'm an employer and I'm looking for my next, as you mentioned, let's just say to use the figure five, let's just say my next five graduates, using inferential futures, I'll be able to pick from a list of candidates who would match ideally perfectly what I'm looking for. Exactly. My company, my role, Etc. And, and, and this is the model, and you can see that there are companies out there that are hunting for this, this model right now. This is really the only way forward as far as recruitment comes. And, of course, looking at it from the point of view of the companies, yeah, this is very powerful. What we want to be able to do uh, is to be the advocate for every single young person that's on our platform be the talent agent for that young person out there saying we're looking for jobs for you we will match you with the right employer at the right place at the right time and that's you know that's the way that theatrical agents work they take a book of people on and they're out looking for those people's work all the time and the model is just the same but the interesting part about what you're doing is it, it's recruitment but you you look at it from the perspective of helping the graduates this is where your starting point is That's you're starting getting them point. to a certain yeah. point yeah. and then as a result of them reaching that certain point this is now becomes yeah. in a way the product yeah. that you speak to it's, it's connect about. it's connecting those 
two sides. Um, universities using a variety of tools at the moment to get their undergraduates jobs. That's great. That's absolutely great. That's exactly as it, as it, as it should be. Recruiters are using a variety of different tools to find the right people. But it's enormously, as you know, it's enormously difficult to locate the right people. And someone, it's, said, it's, someone, it's, I mean, someone said to me in the context of startups, right, that there's a point in the startup where the CEO or the other senior staff in the startup are spending more of their time hiring people. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, than actually doing anything oh, else. Oh yeah, oh, especially in a startup environment. Absolutely, it, it's the biggest challenge. It's yeah. the one of the biggest challenges for any company in general is hiring. For a startup, it's probably the biggest it's, challenge, it's, other it's, than securing it's funding. It's absolutely obviously. existential, isn't it? Because yeah. the wrong hire into a startup is going to torpedo it most Ab likely. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely, so and they cannot afford it. Most startups no, at certain right. stages. No, that's right. That's right. So, um, this is this is the model that we we see out there as being absolutely right for getting in there and creating something that gets into that value chain and takes a cut of it. So that's the business model. And that's not to say that's not to say that ultimately there might be a kind of premium model that students use that we might charge for. But I'm I'm really not set on that at the moment because what we really want to be able to do is to empower the students and the vast majority of students don't have a lot of money. <laughs> They're graduating with £60,000 worth yeah, of debt. Exactly. They are, uh, they are probably as skinned as it gets, as broke as it gets. When as they graduate from uni, right. yeah, I don't exactly. think you can get more broke than that. Um, that's so, right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the way it is. So, okay. Right now, inferential futures at this stage what stage are you at as an organization okay. you as, ed your co-founder who also i believe is the cto as well that's right ed ed in florida is the cto yeah that's right uh, and ed has a tra track record as fantastic track record as a uh, as a technologist and building companies and, uh, and 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 so on so between us you know we've we've been around a bit i think you know People watching this will realise I'm not straight out of college, um, and Ed certainly isn't either. So, yeah, we've uh, we've we've bootstrapped where we are between us. Um, we're just at the beginning of the funding journey now. Going through umpteen, that now, the umpteen, exciting part. Umpteen pitch decks. No, I don't like that one. You know, it's all of, all of that kind of stuff. Started to talk to investors. Uh, we're Working with a um, a great uh, working with a great guy that I've known for some time, Andre, who's a Russian guy, who's uh, on board to help us get the structure of the deal right and find investors and so on. So he's a crucial member of the team. Um, but I know that uh, ahead of us lies a difficult road in terms of user interface user experience and getting something that really people in their 20s, early 20s to early 30s can relate to. Now, all of us involved up to this point, we're a little bit older than that. So uh, I'm keen to look at how we can get some younger people into the country, uh, into the company. We are, we're pre- Pre-funding, right? So this is a kind of really difficult thing to square. Hopefully we'll be funded later this year, that's the plan, uh, when we'll certainly be hiring. Um, I'm interested at the moment in finding somebody who would join us as a member of the team with, I think they'd be, you know the expression T-shaped? You come across T-shaped people? T-shaped? No, no, I can't say okay. I have. Right. The, the notion that, okay, but a lot of people are I-shaped. Like I have deep knowledge and experience in one area. Okay. 
T-shaped person has deep knowledge and experience, but they also have a breadth of knowledge and experience In that goes areas. across a range of disciplines. And you know what it's like with startups. Everybody is doing everything, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I need to find somebody here in the UK, or I would like to find somebody here in the UK that would join us with a technical background, uh, but also that has some kind of knowledge and understanding of building a user interface and a user experience to which this young generation can relate. So technical, UX, UI, and understanding how Gen Z think. Be That's able to connect and relate. Be able to connect. Is yeah. that, am, am I hearing perhaps, is there a, 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 a co-founder opening there, perhaps? That's exactly, that's it. That's, I mean, this is a, a, an opening for somebody that would be interested in joining us with, uh, uh, with, with share options on the, on the table. Uh, there's no money up front. We haven't got any money. <laughs> you're you're pre-funding startup. We're pre-funding. Yeah. We're pre-funding. Pre you know, so uh, every, everything's on a, everything's on a, a, a shoestring. You know. <laughs> as, it, as it is with, with, with it all pre-funding startups. It has startups. to be. And it's great discipline to start a business like that. You know, the big mistake to make is say, I'm going to have a business. All right, I'm going to get an office. And yeah, and all yeah, of this I'm, kind of I'm, stuff. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the, of the, of the former for sure. It's, the, yeah. it's the lean, the lean startup methodology. It's got to be lean. It's got to be agile, and you've got to be absolutely focused on what the user wants. And that's absolutely. you know all of the conversations we've had with young people in different universities around the country have been about this. When do you see this hitting the market? When do you see users, you know, um, starting to get on this app? As you know, and we've, then we've already the got a, a small base of users, which is only in the low hundreds. I mean, we've deliberately not gone out and pushed this hard because we didn't want to be swamped by people coming onto the platform and being unable to get feedback from them because at this point the learning experience is very important to us it's kind of still almost a research project phase oh. to understand you know and we take it very seriously now there's a there's an interesting point that's come up several times in discussion with people about well how do you know that you're going to predict the right career for somebody wouldn't it be awful if you said to somebody, you should go off and do that, and they went off and did it, and then... In reality, they weren't really fit for that. doesn't match. Right. Okay. So there's... Uh, well, there's a number of things to say about that. Going back to the paper question is, interestingly, I spoke to somebody in the city a couple of years ago who said uh, he'd done a career test when he was at school, and it said that he should either become a clergyman or go into the military, which I thought was kind of interesting, sort of combination of sort of oh, things. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right? not, okay. yeah. He's end up as an investment banker, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, wow. okay. How did that come about? <laughs> right, so the first thing to say is this is not, you know, this is not like if we were building something that was a medical diagnostic system, yeah, you would need to get that dead right because if I'm going to tell you having run you through the system right okay must have heard, then let's sit down and have a talk about your health because it looks as though x y z okay that's high stakes stuff that's got to be right that's got to be okay. 100% accurate. 90s right. like high 90s yeah, at least yeah absolutely now this is not the same because it is not saying this is what you must do with your life this Going back to the map metaphor, is saying this is the map of the world and your life that lies ahead of you. We will help you to work out what might happen if you go in a particular direction. So it's not diagnostic, it's not prescriptive. It's about a device and about giving you the tools to make your own decisions. 
but at That's least what? it's advice that it's advice yeah. backed it's, by it's, science it's yeah. it's 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 not you know it is advice you're not as you said you're not prescribing anything but it's probably better advice than they can get from a traditional career center it's the the whole point is that once you bring intelligent data systems into the mix with a huge amount of information that's out there and start to bring that to bear on a problem, then you've got a powerful tool that you can use to help you to understand the future. Uh, we all know there's so much data out there that it's really, really hard. Even to make a decision, um, make a decision about which washing machine you want to buy. To take a trivial example, yeah. there's so much data out there that how do you even begin to make sense of it? To consider, you know, yeah, it yeah. take it take you a weekend to work out which washing machine to buy if you actually went through all of the reports and so on. Now to work out what you want to do with your life. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of things that are concerned with you. Uh, Gen Z too, very, very concerned with finding something that is authentic for them, that speaks to them. They don't want to have a job. Not just a job, not just a job for no. the sake of living. It's got, something it's got, it's got to have their, yeah. have their values. I mean, you can only imagine what problems the oil companies, for example, must have recruiting from this generation, right? I mean, it must be enormous. Uh, I can only imagine. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there must be a vanishingly small number of young people who really have... It'd be interesting to look at that, actually. That, that, would, that would be quite interesting to, 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 to look yeah, at the data that's... for that. But I, I can't... Yeah, I, I, I can't see it to be very differently from what you've just described based on what we know no, about what we know what we gen know. z yeah, that's right. and and obviously yeah. i know what i mean there's do. there's a um if you dig around out there it's very quick to find there's a report by mckinsey on gen z and the values they've got and so on which makes fascinating reading the pew research institute in the u.s carries out re uh, research all the time on all generations, but the, 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 this one particularly. Um, and they are very different, and they're different from each other because, remember, Gen Z starts from young people who are around about the age of 10, 11 now, going through to their early 20s. So that's, I mean, that's uh, only 10, 12 years, but that's a big age that's range still, yeah, in terms of how people age, right? change in that period of time. And we're just starting now to think about how the generation after Gen Z, which I've seen referred to as Gen Alpha, uh, how yeah, what, what are this not going to be like? Um, because I mean, I know I'm sure you've had conversations with uh, you know with with young people um, who who say you know they can't they can't imagine a time when there was only one telephone in the house, for example. You know, oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, no, of course. All, all of that kind of stuff. So for yeah. them, the, the, the world looks very different. And they, they grew up to a different world totally entirely. Different. It's totally. difficult to imagine. I think millennials, um, you know, they, they, they're able to kind of bridge the gap between the previous generation before them and then uh, the one after them, which is Generation Z. But Generation Z, it's more difficult for them to imagine what the it, previous it, generation it, sometimes it, can it talk is. about just yeah. because the world has changed so much. That's right. Yeah. And I, I was talking to someone about rec the problem of recruiting the other day as well in terms of how does somebody, let's say a 45-year-old manager at the moment, how does that person begin to relate to a 21-year-old who's looking for a job. Now, I mean, it's always been a big gap, but now that gap that it's gap's much enormous. Bigger. Yeah, much, Mind much bigger. Mind-blowingly enormous. Yeah. And you've probably seen this. I mean, there are companies who are doing reverse mentoring now where they pair a senior manager with someone junior in the company, and the job is for that junior person in the company to sort of enlighten the older person about how the, you know, how does this generation view the company? What do we see about it that needs to change? The company, so is, well, absolutely, because the company 
ideally should be staying for the next yeah, few decades right. and that's right because and they the yeah. junior ones they're the ones who will be in charge yeah. in the yeah. future so i th yeah. i think we're you know we're in really a really exciting time i've always been excited about the future you know i've always felt that the f well, i'm an the internal optimist about the future you know i really do believe that we will crack all of the problems that face us at the moment i mean taking a complete right uh, you know 90 degree turn the covid uh, epidemic i mean it's quite amazing how we have managed to develop vaccines a matter of months in a matter of months and being able to track actually a matter of weeks yeah it was developed and, but and, then obviously and, the and, trials and be, and, the and be able to track the different variants enormously precisely i mean you know if we t if we manage to get the vaccines to everybody in the world as it as it needs to be if we're going to you're know, really going to crack this um you could say that the virus doesn't stand a chance you know, with the combined kind of intellectual Absolutely. effort. Absolutely. Um, and this is also, you know, it, it's, uh, it's also what entrepreneurism is about, right? Okay, this is a very kind of entrepreneurial kind of mindset, mindset to combat this. So this, climate change is a biggie, but I think technology, you know, we will find the technology to deal with this. Um, Maybe electric cars are not the way forward. Maybe it's a hydrogen economy. I don't know. That's an, in that's an interesting debate. I, that's, I think that could be a big debate as well. That's right. Episode. That's right. But um, I, you know, going, going right back, I started researching uh, the Internet and young people's use of networked computers back in the early 90s. Okay. And I developed a, a, a network of young people around the world at that point in the mid 90s um, and I can remember at that point how optimistic everybody felt about the web and that connectedness that would bring do, people together potentially what it could do yeah and we've seen some pretty amazing things that have happened Obviously, we've got the kind of problems that we've got with, you know, the social media platforms and now. But I firmly believe that we will tackle those and that this massive connection that we've got between people and the ability to process large amounts of data, we can make that work for everybody's good. I, I, I wouldn't be doing this kind of thing if I didn't believe from the bottom of my heart, that that is entirely possible. Well, there you go. There you, there, 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 there you have it. There you have it. And that's what we like here at Silicon Roundabout. The startups who are, you know, we're always talking with, always being part of the community, they are purpose-led. Mm. That's the most important thing. And uh, it's great. It's great. It's great to see that. Yes, it's a business. Yes, it's a business model. Yes, you're trying to make a revenue, but with a purpose. Yeah. There's a reason for our existence, and we're trying to fix a problem. Uh, the vision is so important. Absolutely, Absolutely vital. Absolutely. Patrick, it's been great having you today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, before, we, before we just finish this off, one last thing. You are looking for a co-founder. You are looking for a... We're looking for funding. <laughs> you are looking for funding. Um, but hopefully we should expect this to be hitting the market sometime later this, late later this, year, this year, early, early next, early next year. year. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. So six, between the next six to IDE 10 months, hopefully. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been great. Absolute pleasure having this chat with you. And, uh, well, actually, I look forward to inviting you back again to see uh, what, wh where you guys will be in a few months down I the line. really look forward to coming and talking to you again. Thanks, Mustafa. Thank you very much.